first of all, I would like to state my name, Maria Chappelle Nadal, and I represent the 14th Senatorial District in St. Louis County. I thought I would start off a little bit differently this year. Last year I had a big old map uh, that I was showing you just so you can know where some of the radioactive waste uh, was in St. Louis County and in other areas. But I think that I want to really start off telling the story of this because that is why there is a bill in front of you. Um, I'm also going to give, let's see, some pictures. Th these are my only copies, so I am wanting them back. Um, those are some historic pictures of what radioactive waste actually looks like. The conversation of radioactive waste actually starts um, in the 1930s and uh, into the 1940s. There was a mine in the Belgian Congo, Congo called Shinkalabwe. It was previously mined for copper, for nickel, and cobalt, and everything else that was extracted um, was thought of as waste for that place. Um, we found out that um, the waste was actually uranium, the most pure uranium in the entire world. There is no other mine in the world that has a purified um, ore, uranium ore, uh, that's more than 60 to 80 percent. And that is what came to St. Louis. Not only did this ore, um, uranium ore, come to St. Louis through New York, but Canada, we received their ore as well. Utah, that ore as well came to St. Louis, as well as Colorado. Just so you know the disproportionate amounts of, of what was extracted out of the ore, it's disproportionate. So let's just say the dais that you're at um, is a great big piece of ore. Um, what we were extracting from it was, was very little, so you can look at a chair. Perhaps that's the disproportionate amount of waste versus what we were actually seeking to create the uh, Hiroshima bomb. So because the waste is so disproportionate, um, downtown St. Louis, uh, Malincrot kept their waste there for a very long time, and then they needed extra room. So in St. Louis County, there is an area that's owned by St. Louis City. It's called the Lambert Airport. Um, Malincrot was approved to uh, put some of their waste after the extraction of uranium um, at a place called the SLAP, St. Louis Airport Project Site. And it stayed there not for 10 years, not for 20 years. Um, in the entire region in the area, it stayed there approximately 47 years. The pictures that you are looking at um, is what we call waste, and you have different types of raffinate in that. You have the raffinate from the Belgian Congo, which is the most pure. You have raffinate from Utah and Colorado that are in those pictures. And you see that there was nothing on top of that waste, and you see there was nothing at the bottom of that waste. Right underneath the airport, right underneath that area that you see in those pictures um, is, is groundwater that is right next to Coldwater Creek. After the first 20 years, 1947 to 1967, the waste that you're looking at was moved about a mile or less away uh, to a place called Laddie Avenue. And it sat there, not for a decade, not for two decades, but for several decades. And there was plenty of exposure, as what some people don't know when you are mining um, this ra these radio or this ore, um, if you never moved it, you're at a constant state of equilibrium. Once you mine it, it you're at a constant state of disequilibrium which means that uh, some of these, these alpha and beta particles and gamma rays are not going to reach their first half-life until perhaps 4.5 billion years, four uh, 
450 million years, um, and all of this was exposed, all of it, right? So once this waste that you're looking at was at Laddie Avenue, the responsibility um, was put upon a, a company, a group of people, to dry out what was contained um, in some of the drums. Uh, there are different types of waste, just so you know. Um, and then a machine broke down. And then there was extra waste left over. And that waste was mixed with 18 inches of soil right on the ground. And it was just left there for a while and then it went to the Bridgeton landfills where it remains today. The important piece of this is that just because you are burying this in, in dirt or in a landfill doesn't mean that the life of this radioactive waste is done. As I said before, um, sometimes you can have half-lives of certain elements that are 26 seconds, and sometimes um, you can have a half-life, as I said, 4.5 billion years or 450 million years. And if you would like to check it, I have a, um, a, a data book, a nuclear data book that you can refer to to make sure those numbers are correct. And that leads us to where we are today. There are people, many more than those who are here, who are representing their neighborhood, um, who have gotten sick in your packet that I have for you. There is a list of cancers that are linked to uh, ionizing radiation. I have held to this point in the last 15 months 63 town hall meetings, uh, not only in my district, but outside of my district. And I can tell you that I've been in rooms where the entire room of people had cancer, the entire room. The important part of this is once you are contaminated, once you are exposed to this, your DNA mutates. And the next generation, the children that you have, may or may not be impacted. There is a woman who is a resident of mine who is also a lobbyist up here. Um, who is the only surviving sibling of four. Two of her brothers died of appendix cancer, and one of her sisters, her sister, died of an autoimmune disease. She is the only surviving person they used to play in Coldwater Creek. The reason why I mention these other areas, the slaps, show you the pictures of the, the slaps and the radioactive waste there in Laddie Avenue, it's because it's all the same thing, just in different spots. And um, the reason why Senate Bill 22 is before you today um, is because there are several people who are living in a community adjacent to the landfill who are getting sick. Um, some have had their homes tested. They have tested positive for thorium, uh, which is a daughter product of uranium-235 and 238. Um, and we're in a situation where not only are homes um, and people who are living in homes um, in a pre precarious situation, but also employees. So I get reports, there's a woman who worked at Frito-Lay who had a brain tumor, no history of a brain tumor whatsoever, um, right next to this neighborhood. Um, there's another woman who um, worked at the Labor Council, brain tumor, no history of a brain tumor. Um, there are kids who have uh, brain cancer, brain tumors, 300% higher than what is normal. I mentioned to you earlier, and I think a couple of you are on a, a, a committee with me, uh, where I mentioned earlier today that appendix cancer is very, 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 very rare. It only happens one person out of one million people. One person out of one million people. Within a population of 120,000 people in North St. Louis, we have over 85 cases. That is not normal. It's not normal. And so while I started off this journey when I first introduced this bill, it included three miles of anyone living um, a three mile radius from the landfill as well as a three mile radius from anyone living uh, around Coldwater Creek. Um, and that proved to have a fiscal note of, of uh, 
I want to say $12 billion, which is half of our state's budget in the first place. So I wanted to address the issue. I wanted to um, seek resolve for the community that is in um, the direct pathway of any smoke um, that comes from the landfill. We've had fires at that landfill that have gone uh, directly in the pathway of this neighborhood with, again, alpha and beta particles and gamma rays that are ingested and causing uh, people to get ill. And um, I think it's the first step. There have been other measures in the past um, that have not worked. Um, Congress has not done, the recent Congress has not done their due diligence. Um, as I have been researching, um, our St. Louis delegation, our state's delegation, was way more proactive in the 1990s when it came to resolving this issue. Um, Kit Bond was the leader of the entire delegation um, trying to seek resolve again for the families that have been uh, victims of a legacy, a radioactive waste legacy to save our country. Um, the sad story is, is that it's not just the landfill and not just Coldwater Creek that has remnants of this radioactive waste. It's in multiple places throughout St. Louis City and St. Louis County. Um, but I am trying to address the issues as they face my residents first. So this bill that's before you, there are three parts to it basically. Um, it creates uh, the Hazardous Waste Home Acquisition Program. Um, the the meat of it deals with the Department of Natural Resources uh, putting into place uh, regulations that will allow for families to seek resolve through a buyout. Um, and the last portion of the bill uh, deals with people who know there's radioactive waste on their property and choose to sell or rent it already. In 1991, there was a, a firm, a company, that was trying to sell their property and they were doing what they were supposed to do, getting an environmental study and it tested positive um, for radioactive contaminant. Um, this was addressed, this was an engineering firm um, and they said in, in the note, and it's a really thick package environmental study, um, that it was because of the migration of radioactive waste from the Bridgeton landfills. That was in 1991 and it was left unaddressed. Also in the early 90s, there were employees um, who are living today who would talk about their illnesses that they would get by drinking tap water. Um, I get those same complaints right now about the headaches that employees get at Charter Communications or Spectrum or at Frito-Lay or at, um, let's see, another one, um, AT&T, I get a lot of complaints there as well. Those employees who are impacted by either the air quality um, or we know that we have alpha and beta particles and gamma rays in the air or getting sick. There are a number of cases that have been reported to the state of Missouri of people who have made their coffee or their tea using tap water who've had to go to the emergency room um, because of that consumption. So again, this is a much, much bigger issue that needs to be addressed for the moment. Um, I am just dealing with the 91 homes that uh, comprise the Spanish Village area. There are people who are here today to testify on behalf of this bill and to also tell you what their own stories are. Um, after having 63 town hall meetings and listening to people and their stories, um, the illnesses that they have had, the, as I said earlier in another committee, the medical bankruptcies that they've had to file because of the home they choose to purchase, thinking that it was the dream of their lives for one family that will testify today, it's their retirement home that they bought. It's where they planned on being for the rest of their lives. That ha happens to be also the family that has rate, ha have rates of thorium um, as much as a thousand in values. So I'm gonna let uh, them speak as well, but I am open to any questions that you may have. 
Thank you, Senator. Um, as you and I have talked before, which is at the table, be sure to leave it because that gets entered into the official record um, and Nick will collect those forms. So with that, welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I am Representative Mark Matisson of District 70. Um, these neighborhoods are inside of my district. I've gone door to door in every home in this district. I'm here to kind of help you paint a picture of this neighborhood um, with an average home value of 139,000. Many homes of a lower value. These are families who simply can't afford to just abandon their mortgages and go. There are people who had no health problems prior to moving in and no knowledge of the dangers that they were about to face. 40 and 50 year olds who all of a sudden were developing asthma, other breathing difficulties. There's a family, mm -hmm. their 16 and 17 year old kids started developing health problems, asthma, breathing difficulties, immune difficulties, were constantly ill. They graduated high school, they moved off to college and all of those health effects that they were experiencing disappeared. Their parents want to move as well. They simply can't afford to. Now I understand this bill itself will not actually solve the problem and clean up the material. We're asking our federal government to do that. As a state, we don't have the funds for the ultimate solution. However, if we as a state do not do our part to protect our citizens, why should we be asking the federal government to do their part if we're not willing to do ours? Uh, thank you very much. chairman and the committee for this opportunity to speak. Um, also, thank you, Senator Sh Chappelle Nadal for having us. I'm sorry, you can't hear me. Yeah, thank you. Um, to begin with, I'd like to pass around some pictures. Could you just please to give state, you for some the, state who you are? I'm, I apologize. My name is Brianne McCormick, and I'm a resident of Spanish Village. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read just some things that I wrote. I said, growing up, my parents tried to teach me how the world works and how to be a responsible adult. We were taught that hard work pays off, to treat others how you want to be treated, and that government and its laws are made to protect its citizens. The experience of living within Spanish Village has tarnished these lessons for me. I did work hard. I went to college, graduated magna cum laude. By 22, I had a full-time job as a special ed teacher. The same year, through a mutual friend, I met a nice young man who shared my value of hard work. He too had a full-time job. Along with his sense of humor and sense of loyalty, I was impressed that in his 20s, he was responsible enough to own his own home. Little did he know the ugly truth that lies less than a mile of the property when he purchased the home. Within a year, few years, we were married. We continued to work hard made improvements to our now shared home, and two years later welcomed the birth of our son. In my eyes at this point, we were living the American dream. Little did I know that this perception and trust in my childhood values would change so quickly. When my son was still an infant, I saw an article that would finally give some answers to the obnoxious odors we had been smelling. I learned that there was a subsurface smoldering event in the close landfill that was less than a mile from our home. When reading that benzene was being released in the air while holding my child, I was petrified. Little did I know that this was just the beginning. Then we learned that, excuse me, about even more alarming problems of illegally dumped radioactive waste that was an adjacent landfill. Shortly after learning of the Superfund site, less than a mile of my home, I attended meetings with the EPA representatives, including the regional director. At this meeting, we heard everything from that a chain-link fence would prevent radioactive waste from leaving the site, 
to the fact that the smoldering event could continue, at, if it continued at the same rate, would meet the radiation in a year. I continue to attend meetings to attempt to stay informed on my family's safety. I've attended community meetings, CAG meetings, legal meetings, prayer vigils. At these meetings, as well as countless hours of researching online, I have learned things like off-site contamination, newly found contamination locations on-site, groundwater concerns, missed deadlines for the EPA repeatedly, that the subsurface smoldering event could continue until 2024, and most in recent, recently and concerning that one of my neighbor's homes has been found contaminated for radioactive waste. Along with hearing from others of concerns and mishandling of the site, I had the displeasure of witnessing it myself. In December of 2014, I witnessed, photographed, and reported the surface fire at Westlake Landfill to the authorities. I think it's important to note that it was disclosed that Republic Services never reported that to the authorities, um, that they did not call 911. It was only residents that provided that information. Um, I also witnessed and photographed the water runoff known um, in an area that was known to be contaminated with radioactive waste. Um, originally, the EPA stated that they didn't feel it went through the radioactive waste. I pressed for that area to be tested with the pictures that I had, and it came back that the particles in the area where it had runoff didn't contain radioactive waste, and that water went into a drainage ditch. And on top of being guarded in my own home on a daily basis, I'm always checking to see if I smell anything. And if I do, I have to break the heart of my children by telling them they cannot play outside. I also worry about the times that we do go outside and when there is no order. Is it really safe? Children should have the right to play in their own yard and neighborhoods without their parents worrying about environmental hazards. On a few occasions, we've even had to leave our home because the odor was in our house. The stress and anxiety of daily life is just the beginning of my worries. I also have to worry about my family's health. From my husband's severe dermatitis and low kidney function, to my psoriasis and Meniere's disease, to my son's low muscle tone, developmental delays, and asthma, and my daughter, and I put in here she came as a surprise, I only said that because I want you to be aware that I would never have consciously gotten pregnant in this environment seizure disorder, which has caused her more than 10 seizures in the last year while being medicated. I realize that not all of these are known issues caused by radioactivity and that, or any other volatile chemicals released from the subsurface smoldering event, but some are, and wouldn't you wonder about the rest if you were in my shoes? Then I worry about the future. They say cancer can take up to 20 years to develop after exposure to radiation. Will we be one of the unlucky ones? I'm sure many of you are asking why I don't just move. Trust me, I've considered it at any cost. But let me give you some background neighborhood to moving in my neighborhood. Many of the houses in my neighborhood are vacant. Many have been foreclosed. Many more are rented, and a few lucky ones are sold. I, I feel like it leaves me with three options. Stay and worry about my family's future, walk away from my house and accept any financial consequences, or attempt to sell or rent my house while worrying about putting others in the same situation. None of these options seem like good ones to me. Thinking back to those principles that were taught to me as a child, I find myself in a situation where I've worked hard, but don't feel like it has paid off. I try to be respectful of others, but don't feel like certain neighboring businesses and government agencies are treating my community fairly or professionally. And at this point, I don't feel that my government and its laws have done en nearly enough to protect this community. I truly feel this bill needs to become a law to show the residents of Spanish Village that their government knows they deserve a safe environment to live, where they can enjoy their property, and most importantly, don't face hazards 
on a daily basis that affect their health. I implore you to do everything possible to bring this bill to a law. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions? Um, next up in support. Good afternoon, committee. My name is Robin Daly. I'm a Spanish Village resident since 1999. I was born in St. Louis and raised in Wentzville. Never once heard of the Manhattan Project, nor did I ever think that I would be living less than a half a mile from a burning radioactive Superfund site, but I am. I am also the face of contamination because I am the Spanish Village resident that has this contamination in their home. It's in my kitchen. It's above every basement window, and it's under my refrigerator, and it's in my yard. I wish they would have told me sooner. EPA has had control of the site since for 27 years. They knew the site had off-site contamination of nearby property, the Ford property, but they never thought to travel 0.42 miles south of that landfill to check the nearest neighborhood for off-site contamination because this rad waste wasn't just buried in Westlake, it was laying on the surface. It was allowed to lay on the surface for decades, allowing trees, shrubs, and grass to hold it into place, hopefully. But the wind blows everywhere over Westlake. And I do believe that it is most likely the way it got in to my home. So here I am, the face of contamination living next to what is touted as the most well-managed site, and it is anything but. I have over a thousand photographs I've taken of that, excuse me, hellhole, for lack of better words, because um, it's not managed. They watch surface fires, not one, one in 2014, they didn't call. Brianne had to call. There was another surface fire on the front end they did not call, they as in Republic Services, a passerby had to call. I have witnessed explosions of pipes and waited 15 to 20 minutes for someone to come around and check what this is. And then we're told, don't worry about it, it's okay. You need to go back home. Well, here's another photo, a couple of photographs. The fire at the front section of the, which was in October, pumps, leachate pumps to carry this radioactive benzene-laden poisonous leachate from this landfill because it is all one big quarry hole. So the juices from the West Lake that's contaminated are transferring over and getting mixed up with the Bridgeton landfill, which itself has not been fully characterized. We know of bad things like jet fuel, asbestos, stuff of that nature, but it hasn't been fully characterized, so we just don't know how bad that can be. We're just guessing. So we need this bill. Not only do we need this bill, but we need legislation for full disclosure. We are hardworking people, and $100,000 for a home is a lot of money. I don't care if you're making $15 a minute, $15 a second, or $15 an hour, or $32 an hour. You are all working, we are all working hard for our money, no matter how little it might be to somebody else. And we surely did not think that we would be retiring next to a radioactive burning Superfund site, let alone having our own selves contaminated. And here we are 20 years down the row, road and we're starting to get illnesses. Imagine that. That's the latency period of this stuff. So we need full disclosure. People need to have the information to be able to make an informed decision when you're messing with people's livelihoods and income and for the future of their families. So is it too much to ask that you, if you've got to disclose in other states, if you're living by a landfill, let alone a burning radioactive one, why can't it be disclosed? You know, believe it or not, there are people in my neighborhood who do not have a problem with what's going on at that landfill, and that is fine. I do not share their belief. I have a major problem. I cannot wait to get out from underneath this. 
I cannot wait for hopefully maybe one day Missouri will not grant Republic Services an operating permit in the entire state of Missouri because they are not a good corporate neighbor. I've got pictures to prove how bad of a corporate neighbor they are. Besides living with it, they want to fight and obfuscate and blame everybody else. And yes, this is our federal government's responsibility. But when it fails us and refuses to accept its responsibility, we have no recourse to go to our municipality, shut down, go to our county, receptive, come to our state, hope and pray to God this is going to help us somehow because you are the ones with the connections. We are the people. We look to you. That's why we put you in these positions. And we ask you to please come visit us if you want. I wouldn't stay long. I would just make a drive-by or a drive-through, but I would be glad to show you my home. It is a nice home. I love it. I am going to hate to have to leave it, but I am done with it, and I don't want any more of it, and I thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. You. Are there You can just state your name and, mm -hmm. and proceed. Absolutely. My name is Megan Beckerman. I'm a resident of Bridgeton, Missouri. I live next to a burning radioactive landfill. I live next to a burning radioactive landfill. I have a child that is sick from a rare environmentally triggered autoimmune disease. His name is Trevor. Trevor was not sick until after we moved 1.3 miles from the Westlake landfill. Trevor's little body is pleading for help. He has lost every single hair on his body because his immune system has been confused and mangled by an environmental trigger. He has had his tonsils and adenoids removed because they were in a constant state of inflammation, irritated by an environmental trigger. He has had to be, <clears throat> he has had to be rushed inside while playing in his sandbox in his own backyard because of burning eyes and bloody noses that come with the odors from this landfill. He goes to a school that sent home a letter to all parents warning them of the dangers from this landfill. A school district, like seven of them, sent home a letter to all the parents warning of the dangers of a burning radioactive landfill. Our home is within 1.3 miles from the Westlake landfill, and it is just outside the boundaries of the proposed buyout that comes with SB 22. I'm not quite as close as my friends living in the Spanish Village subdivision and the mobile home park that would be included in the buyout. But knowing how the landfill has affected my family and home, I can't imagine living as close as the Spanish Village residents. They have it bad. Besides the smells and breathing in poisonous gases like my family, they have to live every day knowing radioactive particles have been found in high levels inside their kitchens. Radioactive particles have been found inside their homes. These residents are sick. They're stuck, they're sick, and it's not fair. They are retirees that can't sit outside on their porch and enjoy coffee. They are parents that can't let their children play outside knowing our Attorney General has found radioactive particles inside the trees. Radioactive particles directly linked to nuclear weapon production of World War II. There are residents, so many residents, that couldn't come here today because they are too sick 
too sick to make the hike up the hill to the Capitol building with breathing issues, cancers, autoimmune diseases, and depression. Those residents that were too sick to come are the reasons to pass this bill. These are some of the other reasons. There are really no good reasons to not pass this bill. But these are good reasons to pass it. By passing this bill, you can help them begin to move on, to move out of this nightmare that has consumed their lives. Thank you for your time and attention to this matter. It is truly a matter of life and death for my community. Thank you, Megan. Are there questions for this witness? Get to Washington <coughs> with us. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, be, be sure and fill out a witness form. Have you done that? Okay, and I had a question for you. Okay. Uh, you, you use the term environmental trigger. Do you know, do we know exactly what triggers Trevor's uh, medical issues? No, um, it's called alopecia universalis. It's a rare form of alopecia, and it's known to be, you have to have the gene, but the gene is not, doesn't come out and cause the autoimmune disease without being triggered from an external source. No, we don't know. So we know there was an external, we know there has to be an external source. Yes. And the presumption, of course, is that it's some one of these chemicals or, or radioactivity. Would radioactivity potentially be Absolutely. the trigger? Okay. Yep. Now, do we have Geiger counter readings in the homes? Is that how we're identifying that, or how do we? Um, no, we're having people come in and do independent testing of the dust samples in the homes. The Geiger counters really wouldn't tell the full story because, like Senator Maria said, it's um, alpha and beta particles, and the Geiger counters don't really measure those. Yeah. And I would tell you separately, um, I am lucky to have a couple of friends with Geiger counters who have gone to different spots in Bridgeton and in other places. Again, they measure different things. Breathing, we can't see the particles that we are ingesting right now. So we're, we're filtering the air and then we're testing those particles? The um, DNR, they've done some testing, air testing, um, quality testing. Um, I think we pushed the EPA to do some of that testing. Um, there are other people who may have more specifics on the okay. time period of that. Um, but in this landfill, you have multiple things in it. Um, as you guys may know, the state did not oversee landfills until the mid-70s. And uh, from the reports and investigatory work that I've done, there are, are multiple things before the, the radioactive waste in that landfill that we should be worried about. Um, Senator Nasheed, the demolition from pruitt Igo is in uh, those, those landfills in Bridgeton where um, those families and that property was tested with zinc, cadmium sulfide, anthrax, and radioactive particulates. Um, some of the, the, the illnesses that I see in Bridgeton um, are similar to people who lived in Pruitt-Igoe as well. So you had a lot of stuff in there on top of the radioactive waste, which is burning um, because of the under fire landfill. And we do not know, um, what we do know is that it migrates, it has migrated. Um, some of the reports that I've gotten is that was one landfill back in the 70s, okay. not two. And I just, while you've got the microphone, Senator, I'm, they are just outside the area that's covered in the legislation. Did I understand that right? Yes, she did so, say that. So your house would not be subject to being repurchased or being purchased by the state. So if, if in fact, then that was expanded, uh, because it sounds like if these are if these are real uh, conditions, then certainly we're seeing those real conditions there. Why would the, be, the line be drawn there, and then how would you stop the line after that? Well, as I told you, my initial legislation um, it last year was three miles radius from the landfill, which would have included Megan's home, um, which would have included the mobile home park as well. That's right. Um, across the street from the landfill. Um, as well, I included Coldwater Creek. And 
<laughs> you know, I, honestly, like, I'm still a Democrat. You know, how many Democrats get $12 million in a budget? Not many. Um, the, the initial bill that I had was $12 billion. So if you expanded this to include Megan's home, how many other homes would also be included? I would have to look at that. Okay. Um, there, there's mapping that we had down um, stairs um, to help us with this determination. So I would have to see that. Right. I'd have to look at the map, literally. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Megan, for your testimony. Oh, yes. oh I was gonna add about the air testing. This might help people yes. understand one filters from our vacuums and testing right okay that makes sense All right, and thank you. and they have some people have a lawyer um, the lawyer has an environmental team that has actually perfected a process that actually proves that these particles only could have come from manhattan waste okay. Okay. senator nasheed has a question yeah. it's for senator nadal the one to try to uh remedy this problem uh with the um contamination quite honestly senator um, when I first started out this journey um, I guess in 2012 um, the EPA sent me a lot of documentation a lot of letters um, they as well as the Department of Energy have been very good with that um, to a point where it's kind of overwhelming at times until you start getting into the nitty-gritty Again, in my personal belief, as a legislator trying to create resolve for people who I believe are victims, I do not, in my heart of hearts, think the EPA has done a good job. Um, you know, we talk about alphabetizing grades and, and school districts and all that. I would definitely start off with a D for the EPA if I had to grade them. Um, in fact, the Region 7, the Kansas City, out of Kansas City, they've been terrible. They have not followed up with people. Um, you should know me, of all people. When I'm upset, I have to talk about it. When I'm not upset, I won't talk about something. But when I'm upset, I have to talk about it. And time and time again, when we were supposed to get reports, um, they were promising reports. They promised to do testing, and then they waited a month. Um, we've always gotten a, a great deal of pushback. That is only from my experience trying to create resolve for people who I feel have been victimized by a legacy of um, nuclear weapons waste. Mm. So just the way it's the, the poison is contained, and I'm hearing that it's not. <laughs> your, I just don't understand why. That, qu that question that you have, um, there's 20, almost 30 years of, of record um, of what they have done. There was a task force in the mid-90s, 95, 96, and 97, um, which um, s they started cleaning up around the airport, but it's not, th you, when you look at the minutes of, of these, these task force meetings, of all those three years, they started negotiating out the cost of how much we're actually going to remove. So when you look at um, historical paper, when you look at how deep the um, waste has gone in some of these maps, it's 18 feet, it's 26 feet, um, and then you start talking, what you see in the minutes is the conversation of um, the, the cubic yards, it will cost $5,000 per cubic yards, and we can't afford to put anything more or take out more than X number of feet because it's going to cost a dollar more. Literally, those are the conversations that were had in the 1990s for the airport site, which is still not totally cleaned up. It was, it was um, cleaned up to a point where it was, um, it was not cost prohibitive, but every single time there is a torrential rain or a flood, all of that stuff migrates. It all migrates. Um, the work that's being done in the Coldwater Creek area is because of the work and the advocacy that was done in the 1990s. We haven't even gotten to the sites that people don't talk about yet. Um, so I, that's my personal belief. I will let other people uh, give you their, their thoughts about that, but that's just in my work, how I feel. Thank you. I do have a thought. Um, 
The EPA is not doing anything because of the pressure from politicians that are receiving money from the landfill's owner, Republic Services. Uh, that would be my opinion. So uh, do you guys have a class action lawsuit against the Republic? There's some people who do. I don't know who's involved in that, though, personally. Okay. Any other questions for Megan? Go down, take your seat, introduce yourself, and proceed with testimony. Hello, my name is Dawn Chapman. I live approximately two miles south, so I am not in this bill, but I'm here to testify for it on behalf of my friends who live in the community. And I would just like to start out by saying that um, we just had a phone call with EPA, with the regional administrator, Mark Haig, and we did get a chance to meet with Gina McCarthy in Washington, D.C. Senator Blunt set that meeting up for us, and we were able to go. And in my opinion, what has happened is that thanks to the senator doing all of her hard work and others, Senator Roy Blunt, Claire McCaskill, Congresswoman Ann Wagner, digging and finding these documents, it has forced EPA to do more testing at this site. And you have to remember they've had this site for 27 years. This has been a national priority site for 27 years, one of the most dangerous sites in the nation. And they should have done that testing when they first got it but they didn't because it's EPA. And after being forced to do testing and finding waste, finding that the problem was bigger than they thought, along with the fire, now they're embarrassed because this happened under their watch. So that's what you're seeing. When we spoke with Mark Haig from Region 7 EPA in Lenexa, Kansas, um, they refused to give us a timeline on when they'll be done doing anything, even studies at the site, and really, um, that phone call didn't end well, but what it ended with was there's a new administration now and they're hurrying up to pack their bags and get out because now whoever moves in, it becomes their problem. And that's where we are. Um, I, it, is, it is very difficult to live next to this site. And although there are other sites in St. Louis that the Senator spoke of, this one's on fire. This one's much more complicated. This waste has gotten out and it has hurt other communities within St. Louis, but this one is unique. It is the only site in the nation like it with a fire burning next to it with emissions. And Spanish Village is an isolated neighborhood. It is somewhat nestled up on a bluff that overlooks this site. So everything from the site comes right off the site. And some of this is just sitting on the surface right into Spanish Village. I'm fortunate. I'm two miles south. We do get the wind, but I'm a greater distance away. And I haven't had my house tested. And frankly, we're doing a lot of praying about it because I don't know if it's better to know or better not to know. We're not under any litigation. I'm not suing the owners of the company because I had hoped that after seven years of this fire burning, somebody could make them do the right thing. And from everything, from all these documents, the one thing that stands out is the Kit Bond letter. He tried, he tried. That is the strongest letter if you guys get a chance to read it. But I think what was missing then, because this is a federal problem, is you guys. We've never had backing from the state of Missouri. And it's our hope that Missouri will finally stand up to our federal government and say enough. This Manhattan Project started with us in St. Louis. You get back in here and you take care of these sites. Hanford gets $2 billion a year. And if you read the Kit Bond letter, St. Louis is more contaminated than Hanford. Now, where is it all at? The bottom line is this waste can be cleaned up if it's made a priority. But the people who live in Spanish Village, even to clean up Westlake Landfill, even if EPA were to come in tomorrow and get, get the wherewithal which is just doubtful. They're a, they're a mess of an agency anyway. They'd rather regulate a sea turtle than a people who live next to this landfill. But even if they were, those people still live right there. So anything they do at this site is going to affect these people. Getting them out of there, at least giving them the option, gives them back some level of control. So, I mean, that's where we are. I. I'm very, very encouraged and hopeful with the new leadership this year here in Jeff City. And I think that the federal government needs a swift kick in the behind. It needs a spanking. I'm a mom. I'd spank them if I could. 
you're the closest people we have to it. Somebody needs to stand up and say, that's enough, what about us? Get in here and fix it and we mean it. And I thank you for your time. I hope you consider this bill. The last thing I would say is in regards <coughs> to getting a reimbursement, this is a federal Superfund site. Superfund sites do do buyouts, but in order to do a buyout, we were told this on the phone, basically it would attract too much media and too much national attention to the site and embarrass EPA further. So, and the other thing to remember is that this land is very valuable. This land has $35 million worth of limestone underneath it that at one time was hoped would become a quarry where these homes are now. It didn't happen, the city pushed for it to be residential. But one of the reasons why the argument against making it residential was because of its proximity to this site. So keep that in mind, the state has a lot of options when it comes to what to do with the land. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Senator Nasheed. In 2015, the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services uh, said that the landfill posed no health risk to the community. How did they come to that? I mean, well, they got a spank and they used, <laughs> so, well, actually, I should say EPA got in trouble from the senators because what happened is the data that the health and senior services used to determine that mm -hmm. um, was given to them by EPA. EPA gave them two documents that were just documents, had no author, no nothing. And um, all the risk assessments at this site, none of those were included in that. And so currently, as Excuse you Excuse me just a minute, Don. I'm going to ask you to turn off the light. Um, thank uh -oh. you. The risk, the risk assessment by way of the different uh, illnesses, did they even come and talk to anyone with, you know, the, with illnesses that probably could have been impacted or that have been impacted by? Uh, the landfill and the uh, contamination? They, not the contamination, but the emissions, they walked around. Unfortunately, they were only able to do the average in and get the people who agreed to talk to them. And so they did find that the headaches and the bloody noses, which are described and warned about by the state of Missouri and the Department of Health and Senior Services, they did find that there was an increase in that. They linked the air quality around the landfill to that as being the same as the city of St. Louis. Anybody that's around this landfill, we do not live in a city. This is, this is a suburban area. The air quality around <laughs> Bridgeton should not be anywhere near what it is in the city of St. Louis. And so that was stated. We do have the state of Missouri, just so you know, Department of Health and Senior Services does have a weekly warning. We do have a piece of paper so you can look it up. They tell all of the residents that sensitive individuals should avoid the odor at all costs, and when the odor is there, they should seek medical help if they need it. They have this warning that they put out once a week. And while where I live two miles away, I can heed that warning. Occasionally it does make it into my home, but it's not what the residents of Spanish Village have. You know, you have the state telling you to, s to stay out of this odor, and then they list. It could cause a headache, bloody noses, asthma attacks, breathing difficulty. They have a list of what it could be. These people cannot even heed that warning when it's inside of their home. I have one more, I have, you know, one more statement here. Now, I see that the uh, Republic, and I just posed pose that question to you. The Republic, they paid out 6.8 million in a class action lawsuit. You know, I would, I would highly recommend that the class action lawsuits keep coming because I think that's the only way they're gonna get it is by uh, their pockets being hurt, okay? And so I don't know if it's still a class act. I mean, they, they paid out a lot of money to the 900 and some people in Bridgeton. And what I'm, what I'm hearing now is that that needs to continue to happen until they right. get it. That was and, 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 and continue to fight with the government as well and right. have the government do all they need to do to, to hold the line and protect the health and the, the, the liberty uh, of, of the people that live there. What happened was during the settlement of those litigation, that was maybe two, three years ago that some of them settled and then there was another group that came back and settled. One of the things that, as with anyone knows, and I haven't sued them, but <laughs> you sign away things when you have an agreement. This was, keep in mind that that was before radioactive waste was found inside of people's homes. And so some of those people who have taken that settlement, it's been suggested that 
part of it was radioactive waste. Again, they didn't expect to find it in homes, and they did. And I do agree with you. I think all efforts should be exhausted. I think um, the main thing that this bill does, besides gets people out of harm's way, is it really, really, and I can tell you this because I know EPA is mad that this is happening today, it really sets a precedent for how the state of Missouri um, the tol tolerating this kind of behavior from a federal agency. Thank you, Thank Dawn, you. for your testimony. Are, how many other, we have about 30 to get into the witness seat. Uh, that would be fine as well. And don't forget to witness for us. Please introduce yourself and proceed. <laughs> Hello, first I just want to thank you all for allowing me to speak. My name is Kristen Camuso. I currently live in St. Peter's, but a year and a half ago I was a longtime resident living less than one and a half miles from the Bridge and Westlake landfill. While living in the area around the landfill, my family and I found ourselves in a perpetual state of vulnerability and apprehension caused by the unsafe conditions at the landfill. Within the first year of the landfill fire, my daughter was diagnosed with asthma. Up until then, she had never experienced difficulty breathing. As a parent, watching your child gasp for air is intensely horrifying and leaves you feeling powerless. On many occasions, the odor coming from the burning Superfund site held us as prisoners in our own home and our car and kept us from enjoying the outdoors. I spent my entire life unknowingly surrounded by the radioactive waste, first near Coldwater Creek and later near the Westlake landfill. And now I am living with the profound consequences. In the last few years, I have had my gallbladder removed, a total hysterectomy, one adrenal gland removed, and thyroid cancer. More recently, doctors found a tumor on my remaining adrenal gland and a lesion in my liver. My body cannot take much more of this surgical mu mutilation. Um, needless to say, I'm kind of cutting through this to speed up. Um, as soon as our lease was up, when we, were, when we were living close to the landfill, I made the decision to move my family out of the area. And the year and a half since we have moved, my daughter has not had to use her inhaler even one time. Um, the residents living near the landfill deserve the right to a better life, a life without constant worry and fear, a life that their where their children and grandchildren can live and play freely without the fear of what's blowing in the wind or lurking in the corners of their homes. These families living on the edge to no fault these families are living on the edge to no fault of their own. They've been laughed at, manipulated, and bold-faced lied to. These families deserve a fighting chance, and that is why I'm here today to support Senate Bill 22. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 13, I don't know if you're familiar with the Council 2. Yes. I mean, because there can be a speedy trial uh, request. If, if there's an outcry, the attorney general's office could file for a speedy trial. Well, I think the problem is now is that um, it's no longer attorney general, and we have to see if Hawley will pick up where the attorney requester left off. Yeah, there, there is a suit. Um, we've had to deal with, um, I forgot what you call it, the, where it was, like, I think Republic wanted to be, um, under federal courts and then there was a, a you know they said no it could be in the state courts etc so there's a long that's why even with these lawsuits republic continuously pushes back because they have a lot of money to do that yeah, but there's a law there's a law that mm -hmm. you should look at and, and, and it's called speedy trial look into that thank you thank you for your testimony thank you thank you next witness Hello, my name is Ed Smith. I'm the policy director for the Missouri Coalition for the Environment. We have members who live within the Spanish Village neighborhood. Uh, our organization has uh, addressed radioactive waste issues in the St. Louis metro area since the, the early 90s, and we are here today in support of Senate Bill 22. I just want to point out that, at least related to the, the state's lawsuit against Republic Services, Republic did push for a delay in that. And we tried to get a meeting with uh, Attorney General Hawley this week while all these great folks are in here, uh, up here. But being at his first week, uh, that was not doable. So we will take Senator Nasheed's uh, advice and, and look into that. Um, the, the issue here is that radioactive material was discarded in a landfill without any government oversight or permission. It sat there at the surface for, for decades, blowing in the wind. Uh, and until private investigators came into Spanish Village, uh, no, no testing had been done uh, to, of people's homes. Uh, we, we are greatly concerned with the, the EPA's testing. We are involved in the, the process in and out. We uh, 
have been alarmed by the fact that the EPA has refused to test the 600 feet between the smoldering fire and the radio known areas of radioactive material. Over the last couple of years, the EPA had identified areas of radioactive contamination in the landfill that it had not identified in the previous 25 years they had jurisdiction at the site. In fact, in 2008, the EPA made a decision to cap and leave the radioactive waste at the landfill, even though there's no liner separating the groundwater from the radioactive material. Lo and behold, the EPA never even considered a fire a threat to the radioactive waste and that implication on the health and wellness of people around the landfill. That decision is under reconsideration right now. We have supported federal legislation to transfer this site over to the Corps of Engineers, so all sites in St. Louis where radioactive remediation is taking place are under the same agency, so we have some consistency. Um, we, we support having these people removed from their homes. The St. Louis County did a health survey. They knocked on 200 doors within a two mile radius of Westlake Landfill and did a, a, a control group of other similar homes within St. Louis County. Uh, they found that there were elevated levels of COPD and asthma risks, not statistically significant, but they found more within the area around the landfill. What they found that was statistically significant is that more people around the landfill are concerned about odors on a regular basis. And one thing that we know is that chronic stress, and this is well documented, can lead to physical health problems. Uh, the, the landfill has been smoldering since 2010 and is expected to last until uh, mid-2024, 2025. So uh, the, we can't have folks living under chronic stress situations for 15 years next to a smoldering landfill for which they have no control over. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none, I'm asking you to do that. Thank you. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Yes, hello, I'm Gail Thackeray. I work for the Franciscan Sisters of Mary as a Justice Ecological Coordinator. Um, we're the founders of SSM Healthcare, uh, which has over 20 hospitals throughout Illinois, <coughs> excuse me, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Wisconsin. Uh, we, have an, uh, we have adopted a congregational focus of compassionate care of creation in collaboration with others. Many of our sisters live and work within or less than a mile of uh, the Westlake Landfill Superfund site and have sisters living in Senator Nasheed's district as well. Over the past four years, we have also encountered the persistent and toxic odors from the landfill along with the awareness that an underground fire, which is inexhaustible, moves ever closer to nuclear radioactive waste. This has led the Franciscan Sisters of Mary to be a continued presence at all the public and government meetings that try to explain this complex and hazardous crisis to our community. We know our neighbors are in perpetual emotional distress over the implications of the health of their families as the value of their investment in their homes erode away each year when they no longer have control over the quality of the life they experience. In these four years, the one thing we have learned, for health's sake, residents don't have the time for this landfill to be dissected any further. And there is not one more report that the EPA or public services can undertake or research to improve the quality of life in our neighborhoods and North St. Louis. Senate Bill 22 will ensure the best possible health outcome for those living in Spanish Village nearest to the nuclear waste. And we sincerely thank this committee for giving our neighbors the immediate attention and relief this measure can provide. Thanks so much. Are there any questions for this witness? And I'm here representing the uh, Missouri chapter of the Sierra Club. And just want to express on behalf of our 8,160 members and 39,000 supporters in Missouri, uh, the Missouri Sierra Club supports Senate Bill 22. And in the interest of time, I won't read my entire statement, but just it's, it's far past time for action to be taken to protect citizens living uh, near the Bridgeton Landfill and the Westlake Landfill. The issue of the uh, underground fire is seven years old. The issue of the radioactive waste is 70 years old. And when you combine the two issues, a serious public health and environmental problem, and not only will it get re give relief to the uh, residents in near proximity, uh, passing this bill would show the seriousness of the state of Missouri in confronting uh, these uh, crises. Thank you. Are there, are there questions for this? Hi, my name is Karen Nickel, and I'm a longtime resident of Maryland Heights 63043. In the fall of 2014, I learned from a Missouri State Health study that the zip code 63043 has a higher than expected incident of children, children, childhood brain cancers in children under the age of 17. 
It is very scary as a parent that every time your child has a headache, that your first thought immediately goes to, does my child have a brain tumor? On top of our constant concern for our children's health, the reality of the danger we face became more frightening when seven school districts surrounding the Westlake Bridgeton Landfill area in fall of 2015 sent home letters alerting parents of the protocol if a catastrophic event should occur at the landfill. The schools have informed parents that children may have to shelter in place at school. Can you imagine what it's like to put your child on the bus in the morning and not know when you're going to get him or her back? Um, every day you ask yourself, is this the day? One school district even went as far as to send a home letter asking parents to have additional medication on hand at school in case of overnight or extended stays at school. This is very costly for parents. It is a financial burden cast upon families as insurance does not cover extra medication. The shelter in place and or evacuation plan that was made for the Westlake landfill is constantly present in the mind creating fear and stress of parents. I've shared this information with you today because I want you all to understand what life looks like for those living near the landfill. This buyout program will give residents living closest the option to relocate their families away from this site if they so choose. Please keep in mind that Republic Services, the landfill owner, did a temporary relocation of residents in 2013 living within one mile radius around the landfill due to health and air contamination concerns during the installation of the cap and cover over the underground fire. For four years, I have devoted my attention to fighting for protection and saving my community from the most dangerous site in the nation right now. I hope that those with the power, those that can be a voice for the people, will prevail and take the necessary steps to get this bill passed into law and prove that we are a state that will put the people first. Thank you. Was it Karen? There's links on the back of that page that will link you to probably most everything that you've heard today if you want to go and look up anything. Okay. Does, does this, is this available to us electronically since so those links would actually be links? We can send it. Okay, that might be good if you could get that to the committee chairman and they could send it to the committee. Other questions for this witness? Now, did you say that you you are a resident that would be affected? I live 1.8 miles away from so the landfill. So you're, you're not included in the no. bill, but you are affected by the landfill. We do have the odor. Um, we do experience some of the difficulties faced with this issue. Our children stand out at bus stops and the odor is so awful that it, it permeates their clothing and they take it to school with them and kids make fun of them. Uh, so we all are infected by the t Westlake. Did, an, did another witness talk about the temporary relocation? Uh, I think somebody might have mentioned it. Okay, I missed it, I guess. So that was when they were actually doing something to the landfill. They put a cap over the landfill cover yeah. to help reduce the, uh, the odor issue. All right, other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank Good afternoon, thank you. My name is Debbie Disser. I work just south of the landfill in the Riverport Complex area. Um, I just want to speak about how it affects me getting into work. And um, when I'm at least a mile away from the landfill, I have to turn off my air conditioning system to make sure that the odors don't come into my car. And sometimes that doesn't even work. And I have to make um, preparations to get from my car into my office because I have asthma and I've had to use my inhaler because of that situation and also when I just to go shop and eat in the area I have that issue I end up with nosebleeds headaches um, so that's what I'm fighting with and I can leave the area I live five miles away from the site but those that live in Spanish Village in the mobile home parks they can't leave this odor gets in their houses, they can't, they have to leave to get away from it, so. She's not telling you something. There, the pictures that I had up there at the slaps, her family lived right across the street from that, and you need to tell them the statistics, because the, they apply to the same community. Okay, um, I just, I lived up by McDonnell Douglas World Headquarters, and I played on the ball field across from the St. Louis Airport site. Um, in 2007, my brother was diagnosed with a glioblastoma multiform, stage four. Um, he was 41, and he passed the following June, at the age of 43, um, from this cancer. Um, so I'm helping to educate the community about this because of what happened to our family. Nobody should have to 
go through that issue. Thank you. For your testimony, other questions for this witness? I, I, your, the, your workplace is inside the area that is affected by this legislation? I'm south of, I'm across so, the, the so highway the workplace from it. Is, is not inside the area, but no. how, so how does the workplace uh, filter the air? Or do they do they treat the air? Do they do something to protect you as we, an employee? We, we pull inside air out as, I asked my building manager, you know, are you concerned about the landfill across the highway? And he said, no, we're told there's nothing to be worried about. Okay. So, no, um, I will tell you, I don't know how many have, but I have seen high incidents of cancer in my building. So right. it affects the workers. All right, thank too. you very much. Next and witness. Senator, just to follow up with that, the same reports with Charter, the same reports with AT&T employees, mm -hmm. the same reports with uh, Frito-Lay employees, you. as well as the Labor Council, which has an office there, um, like employees are getting sick. Okay. My name's Susan Foley, and I do not live in the area. I actually live outside Winsville, um, but I am in a group that was doing a survey in Spanish Village and we went to many homes. And the one I want to tell you about is a widow whose home backs up to the creek. And I understand that she's had lung cancer but has never been a smoker. Um, she used to have a garden, but she doesn't eat from it anymore because she's afraid to. She had her basement flood. She wants to move. Her house is paid for. She can't move. Um, she feels very hopeless. She feels like the government has let her down. Talking to her was really hard for me because I had a home along Coldwater Creek, and my circumstances were the same. My husband had a garden every year. We ate the vegetables. Our basement flooded. Raised my kids there. Um, and my daughter has a fatal leukemia that is environmental. It's CML. And there are, in my old neighborhood, there's at least four cases of this rare leukemia. And so talking to her brought back a lot of feelings that Spanish Village is going to see what we see in Coldwater Creek area. And we need SB 22 not just to pass this committee, but we need it taken to the floor. So I appreciate you letting me talk today. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there questions for this witness, please? My name is Tara Douglas. I used to live by the landfill for 14 years, sold that home to my daughter, who's been there for 15 years. I've had cancer, I have thyroid problems, I have AFib, I have several things that are related to nuclear exposure. And my children have a lot of problems. I don't want to go into that. I, I'm going to give you a paper with all that on there. I want to read a statement that was written by one of the residents in October 2015 that tells the quality of life that these people live with every day. I hate that my Facebook page, pages are filled with radiological waste reports affecting the health and well-being of my community. The amount of sick children and adults in our elementary school alone has enacted a state health investigation. I would rather be making Halloween treats as opposed to marching downtown to plead with the governor's office to help us. I wish I was posting pictures of my kids and pets and recipes, anything, because those kind of posts get the, a lot of likes. I wish we could go for neighborhood walks without being concerned about a burning landfill smell. I wish we could go to the store without running to the car, covering our faces, hoping we don't get sick. I hope this Halloween, this burning landfill doesn't smell. I'm so sorry that my posts are filled with nothing but fear and pain, death and impending doom. Never in my wildest dreams. And lastly, I wish our government cared about the people. And this was before we knew that it had spread off this site, before we knew that there's a home that definitely carries contamination in it. So this is your chance to take this knowledge and right the wrongs that the United States government, the EPA, and the Republic Services have done to these innocent victims. I'm asking you please to support this bill and move these vulnerable families far from the negative effects of Westlake Landfill. 